So we are continuing in our study and our sermon series on the book of Acts, the gospel in motion. And today we are still in chapter 19. So if you recall, last week, Pastor Pedro explained to us that the Apostle Paul returned to Ephesus, where he was continuing with his uh, third missionary journey. He was essentially on his way to Jerusalem. Now, we know that from our studies in the book of Ephesians that Ephesus was the capital of the Roman province in Asia. It was located at the mouth of the Caister River on the east side of the Aegean Sea. It was probably best known for its great temple, Artemis, or Diana, which was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was very much an essential political, educational, and a commercial center that ranked with Alexandra in Egypt and Antioch in Pisidia in the southern Asia Minor. And if you can recall, also a few weeks back, Pastor Gareth preached a sermon on growing in grace. And he explained that whilst Paul was on his second missionary journey, he arrived at Ephesus for the first time. And there we know that he was accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. And it was here where Paul reasoned with the Jews in the synagogues. It was here where he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in his letter to the Galatians, he tells us that this gospel was revealed to him not of human origin. He did not receive this gospel from any man, nor was he taught the gospel by anyone else. Instead, he received it by the direct revelation of Jesus Christ himself. Because if you remember, prior to his conversion, Paul was entrenched in Judaism. He persecuted the church of God. Essentially, he literally tried to destroy the church of God. But this was until he met God on the road to Damascus, where God set him apart by revealing his son, Jesus Christ, to him. But now following his conversion, we notice that Paul did not go to directly to Jerusalem and uh, spend time with the other apostles. No, he didn't. He spent approximately three years in the wilderness, in what we refer to as the Nabataean Arabia, and where he prepared for the ministry of the Lord. And it is here where we believe that he received the gospel and learnt about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Paul left Ephesus, and initially he was reliant on Priscilla and Aquila to spread the gospel. However, he vowed to return, and last week we learned that he was true to this word. Paul, uh, we witnessed that Paul used an effective method of ministry. He used a combination of evangelism and discipleship making, as he did with all the other places that he visited. He went to the synagogues and he reasoned with the people there. He proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ because he wanted to make certain that they understood that in order to be a follower of Christ and in order to be called a Christian, that you had to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now we notice in chapter 19, verses 7, Paul laid his hands on these disciples. And what happened? the Holy Spirit came upon them and they started speaking in tongues. They started prophesying, much like what happened on the day of Pentecost. So they were no longer really learners, but they were true disciples of Jesus Christ. And we also notice that he took the disciples to the hall of Tyrannus, and it was here that he taught them the truths of the gospel. His purpose would have really been to instruct them on the Word of God so that they would become lifelong students of the Word, that they would follow and that they would obey the Lord Jesus Christ. He would help them understand their responsibilities, not only to each other, but their responsibilities to the local church, that they would use their gifts to serve one another and to serve the local church. And this is the same strategy that the worldwide church adopts today. This is the same strategy 
that as a local church adopts. And this is the same strategy that we here at New Life adopt as well. When you attend the membership classes, we know that as elders we go into great depth and we explain the strategy to you so that you understand the strategy in detail. So in our scripture passage today, we see that Paul is still in Ephesus and he continues to evangelize. But this week we witness Paul use extraordinary miracles to spread the gospel of Christ, much like Christ used in his ministry when he roamed the earth. Today, we see the God of miracles, which is essentially the title of my message. But what I really want you to, or what I want to point to you today, and I want you to see this, is that we should allow God to use us according to his will and purposes for his glory, and not for us to use him for our own purposes or for our own selfish desires and ambitions. So I know I'm putting the punchline out there, so please don't go to sleep yet. Please keep attention. I want you to know this, that we should allow God to use us according to His will for His glory and not for us to use God for our own selfish ambitions and desires. So let's go ahead and let's read the Word of God together. So if you don't mind standing so we can show reverence for God's Word. So we'll be reading, uh, we are in Acts chapter 19, and we'll be starting at verse 11 and reading through to verse 20. So Acts chapter 19, verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. The seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirits answered them, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And the fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found that it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to give you praise, honor, and glory that you deserve today, Lord. We want to thank you for your word, Lord. And Lord, as we dig deep down into your word, Lord, we pray that we may do it justice, Father. We pray that as we examine these texts, Lord, that we may see how we can live our lives better, Lord, for your service and for your glory. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my Lord my rock and my redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. So as many of you know, we celebrated the graduation of our daughter from high school a few weeks back. We were so thrilled for her because she spent many, many hours studying for her final exam, where she had to write facts and figures down on a piece of paper so that she could be assessed for all her knowledge and her skills. And I'm sure all of us in this room, right, has spent some time, okay, some longer than others, in some sort of formal learning institution trying to achieve a certificate of some sort. And as for you, you know that I am a man of science, that I am involved in sort of physical rehabilitation. 
And on any given day, I'm given a case, and I use evidence-based practice to help restore the health of this particular person. Evidence-based practice that has been determined by rigorous research over many, many years, where there has been syst systematic investigation of science theories and hypotheses. But we see now, we study the pages of scripture, and we come across events that defy logic and defy reason. And we see, even in the Old Testament, the are incidences full where God displays his power and his glory. And it dates back to even Genesis, where God formed the earth, is a primary example of God's power. The flood is another example. The confusion of the tongues at Babel. Sarah falling pregnant at her age. And Moses and the burning bush. We see Moses' rod turn into a snake. The plagues of Egypt the crossing of the Red Sea, the pillar and the clouds of fire, the water from the rock in Rephidim. We see the fall of Jericho and the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, being delivered from the fire. And the list goes on and on and on. And not to mention the New Testament pages, right, where we see the wonders and the miracles of Jesus Christ while he roamed the earth. Jesus is teaching and his miracles were an integral part of his ministry where he spread the kingdom of God. We know that Jesus fed thousands upon thousands of people. He cast out evil spirits and healed people. He healed the blind, the deaf, the infirmed, and the injured. He also turned water into wine. He defied the uh, nature of the elements of nature by walking on water and by calming the storms. He allowed Peter and the apostles to catch an enormous amount of fish on more than one occasion. He also raised people from the dead, and Jesus Christ himself was raised from the dead. But these miracles are but a tiny fraction of the wonders that he performed while on earth, because John tells us in chapter 1, he writes, Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the word itself could not contain the books that would be written. So what was the source of Jesus' strength uh, over the forces of evil that sought, to, uh, that sought to bring pain, disease, and suffering on people? Well, we know that he derived the strength from the power of God himself. And it came from his long, intense relationship with his almighty Father. However, we know that Jesus wasn't the only one who performed these miracles. And Luke records it here in the book of Acts for us, these specific events, uh, to convince not only Theophilus, but also to all those who read this account in the book of Acts. Because in chapter 1 in Acts, we see that Jesus was resurrected. And we witness the miraculous ascension of Jesus into the heavens. And in Acts chapter 2, we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the 12 apostles. And this was accompanied by the miraculous wind, fire, and of course the speaking of tongues. And many other miracles were performed by the apostles. We saw that Peter healed the lame man in the temple in chapter 3. And God answered Peter in a miraculous earthquake in chapter 4. And of course, Ananias and Sapphira were slain by the Lord in chapter 5. And the prison doors were also opened by the angel in chapter 5 as well. Stephen performed many wonders, signs, and miracles, and so did Philip in Samaria in chapter 8. Ananias also healed Saul's blindness while he was on the road to Damascus, and that we observe in chapter 9. Peter healed Aeneas, and in Joppa, Peter raised Dorcas from the dead, which we also see in chapter 9. Cornelius saw an angel, and as a result, his family came to faith. His family also spoke in tongues, and they were saved by the preaching of Peter. Peter saw the vision on the roof as well, and he spoke with the Lord. 
Peter performed many miracles, and in Iconium we saw also miracles, and this occurred in chapter 14. And at Lystra, Paul healed a crippled man. And last week we see in Ephesus that the 12 men spoke in tongues, and they prophesied because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So today, in our scripture, we see a continuation of these miracles taking place. Because it says in um, chapter 19, verses 11 to 12, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. So my first point, yeah, we see the power of God revealed through these miracles. But notice who was doing these miracles. It wasn't Paul, right? It was God performing these miracles through the hands of Paul. And even the handkerchiefs and the aprons that he wore had the power to heal people, had the power to release them from the evil spirits. Now these must have been the headbands or the outer clothing that Paul wore when he was making his tents. And we must remember, in the ancient world, there was this belief or this widespread belief that mystical power could be transfer or transferred to inanimate objects, even to clothing. But we must know that these were not magical objects, but rather it was the presence of the Holy Spirit that remained in connection with these objects that Paul had come into contact that contained all this power. So, why do you think God uses extraordinary miracles in the Bible? It seems clear that God was using Paul to reveal his great and wonderful power, his magnificent glory. And the more and more we delve deep into the book of Acts, we can see that these miracles were performed by the apostles, contributed to the growth of the church much like during Jesus' time. Time and time again, we witness that the people saw these miracles of healing, and these people came to faith and repentance. These people were saved. So my question is, can God heal miraculously today? Of course He can, right? Does He heal miraculously today? I certainly believe He does, but I don't think it's as often as the signs and the wonders movement claim it to be. It probably happens on the rare occasions. In my experience, uh, miraculous healings and deliverances from demons occur, but again, they are rare. While God does at times heal supernaturally, I believe the gift of healing that we see here is really limited to the apostles and to Paul during those times, and his close associates. Now, the so-called faith healers of today probably don't experience near the kinds of results that Paul and the apostles saw during their time. But I also believe that we witness the power of God on a regular basis. Now, it might not be considered miraculous as we see in our text today, but we see it in action in the ordinary lives of people today where people's lives have been transformed by the indwelling Holy Spirit, where an adulterous husband has, who has been addicted to pornography responds to the gospel of Christ and confesses his sins by repenting, by choosing to remain faithful to his wife and to his family and to lead his family in the ways of the Lord. Or when a teenager suffering from anxiety and depression struggling with ordinary, everyday relationships and responds to the power of God by transforming their lives and seeking to live for Christ. What about a drug addict or an alcoholic that resorts to a life of crime in order to fund their habit, where they've tried program after program after program and nothing has worked? They haven't been able to beat their addiction, where they respond to the power of God and change their lives. They literally turn their lives around. This is the power of God in action, brothers and sisters. Do you believe in miracles and healing? Or do you just think they're just stories and myths? Friends, 
God uses miracles today to display His power, His glory, His majesty, so that people can come to repentance and faith for His own purposes and for His glory. So we see now, we witness the power of God being revealed through Paul and the apostles, through their extraordinary gifts of healing and miracles. But now notice what happens when people attempt to use God for their own selfish purposes, for their own ambitions. We see my second point. We witness the frailty of man revealed, which is in chapter 19, 13 to 16. Because verse 13 tells us that there were these itinerant Jewish exorcists. In other words, these Jewish exorcists roamed from town to town and they traveled from place to place. And they attempted to use the name of the Lord Jesus to cleanse people of evil spirits, much like the apostles. They most likely used extensive ceremonies and spoken formulas to try and free people of their diseases and the influence of the evil spirits. If you recall, we learnt about Simon Magnus in chapter 8 and about Bar Jesus in chapter 13, who were typical examples of these charlatans trying to use the name of the Lord. They attempted to use the Lord's name with their own selfish ambitions and desires at heart, mainly for financial gain. And in verse 14 tells us, the seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Skeva were doing this. Now, there is no record in the scriptures of a Jewish high priest by that name. So they probably tried to adopt this name to impress the people. Uh, so the account tells us now that one day they encountered the evil spirit. And this evil spirit responded back and said, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize, but who are you? And notice the result of their attempt. The man in whom the evil spirit, he leaped onto them, he mastered them all, he overpowered them, and they ran out of the building naked and afraid and wounded. We can witness and see how frail and how weak they in fact were. Initially, probably acting so confident and arrogant, but that they were exposed by the demon-possessed man. It must have been a really comical sight to watch them fleeing from the house, naked, wounded. The demon rejected their attempt to expel him from his victim. Even the demon rec recognized that these exorcists had no authority over him. Unlike Paul and Jesus, this, confirm, this confirms that the power to expel the demons belong to Jesus and the apostles. No one else. Why? Well, it is because the power came directly from God himself, from the Holy Spirit. And even the demons testify to this and give testimony to this. But friends, the sad reality is today... There is this false teaching, and people attempt to heal others and exercise people of demons. And they do not possess the gifts of healings or the gifts of miracles. I recall a few years back of a story of a service taking place where a pastor requested those who wanted healing to come forward to the altar and to form different cues or different lines. And he told them, certain ailments that they had to form or to stand in that queue. But of course, each line had a price tag attached to it as well, depending on your budget. Charlatans really exploiting the name of Jesus for their own financial gain. Or perhaps you have heard of an anointed prayer cloth. Modern day TV preachers sending out these little squares of cloth that have been anointed, that they ask the audiences to touch them as a point of reference, but of course, to send a donation as well. One particular parish wrote this, and I want you to listen to this. Are prayer hankies scriptural? 
prayer handkerchiefs are very scriptural and have been used throughout history with exciting supernatural results. Modern day believers are still using anointing cloths or prayer hankies to give to those who are in need of a miracle or an answer to prayer. And it seems that the popularity of prayer hankies is increasing. Pastors or elders of the church will anoint the cloth with oil using olive oil and then pray over the cloth asking God to meet the demand or the need of the one who it is intended for. Most of the time the person is given the cloth to keep. However, sometimes the cloth is anointed for someone who is unaware that they are being prayed for. In these circumstances, the cloth or the handkerchief is normally placed in their home, perhaps under the mattress or in a vehicle. And this is usually done when you are praying for someone who is in spiritual bondage and would not be willing to receive prayer for themselves or even be willing to receive a prayer cloth or a prayer hanky. There are so many anointed men and women of God who use prayer hankies on a regular basis and even blessed to see exceptional answers to prayer by an exceptional prayer answering God. And if you are interested in purchasing a prayer handkerchief for yourself or someone, please visit www.handkerchiefsblessings.com. So brothers and sisters, you might be absolutely shocked by this jargon, but there are many incidences like this. Many people who are exploited, many people who want answer to prayer and to miracles who fall for these scams. We need to be discerning. We need to see that the scriptures show us that these imposters will be exposed, how weak that they are and how ineffective they are compared to the glory of God. So what is the result of all of this? On the one hand, we see that the people were witnessing extraordinary miracles performed by Paul and the apostles, that the people were being cured of their illnesses and being cleansed of evil spirits. And on the other hand, we see these so-called exorcists who were being beaten up badly and running away out of the house naked from the demon-possessed individuals. So we see my third point, the confession of faith, which is found in chapter 19, verses 17 to 20. Today, these events, we see that these events became known to all the residents in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. And what happened? The fear of the Lord fell upon them, and the name of the Lord was extolled. In other words, the Lord was praised. He was exalted. And also noticed that those who practiced these magical arts and sorcery witnessed the power of the Lord Jesus Christ at hand. They chose to believe in the gospel of Jesus. So what did they do? They held a bonfire. They burned the books in the sight of all. They wanted people everywhere to see that they had confessed and that they repented of the evil that they had practiced. And the scriptures tell us that the combined price of these books was huge. If the pieces of silver were drachmas, where one drachma was a working man's daily wage, in today's terms, it probably added up to about 5 million US dollars. They could have probably used that amount to finance a new sanctuary in Ephesus. But no, they didn't want anybody else to be contaminated by this spiritual deception. So they rightly burned it, much like an alcoholic who throws his last bottle of whiskey in the trash, or a person who's addicted to pornography throws his, his magazines in the trash as well. So in this account today, it is clear that when we read, we see that God confirmed the apostleship of Paul using the gifts of miracles. And this awakened the people's inquiries, and it fixed their attention to it. We know that the God we serve is a mighty and a powerful God who loves His children 
and doesn't want any harm to come to them. He is a good God. He is holy and He is righteous. There is no darkness in Him whatsoever. He wishes people to come to repentance and to faith. And yeah, we witness and we see in this account people confessing their sins by burning their books. And when a person comes to faith by the Holy Spirit, they undergo conversion. Their life turns around, and we refer to this as repentance. Now, the Greek word for repentance is metanoia, which literally means a change of mind. And this is what we were discussing this morning in our class today. So, in other words, when we repent, we repent, sorry, because we hate our sin. Although part of us might still love our sin, true repentance involves a godly sorrow for having offended a holy God, and we resolve to rid ourselves of sin. We may have previously tried to rationalize our sin, but now we literally have a change of mindset. We see our sin for what it is, the evil thing that it is. So if you are sitting here today and you are listening to this message and you haven't confessed your sin, please, I urge you to consider this because the scriptures are clear. Paul makes it clear in Romans that the wages of sin is death. But if you wish to choose life, to live in the eternal kingdom of God, to accept Christ as your Savior, for we know that He is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. So I want us to draw this to conclusion and some form of application. How can we apply this to our daily life, to this portion of Scripture that we have read today? It is clear that when we allow God to use us for His glory, wonderful things can happen. We need to be people of integrity, much like Paul was. Paul was always trying to peep, uh, always trying to point people to Christ. He was never trying to get them to look at himself, much like the exorcists were. And the Bible shows us that God delights to pour his blessings on his people. For Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Clearly, we see that we can receive all the riches of Christ when we come to Him for salvation. Because when we come to Christ, He grants us everything pertaining to life and to godliness, which Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3. But we see that when we use God for our own selfish ambitions, it is clear that we haven't repented of our sins. You see, when we come to God and try to use Him for, for ourselves, for our own selfish ambitions, therefore, we haven't truly repented of our sins. For example, when we wish to receive some financial gain for a promotion at work, where we want to live in a fancy, ha a fancy house or drive a fancy car instead of using the blessings that God has given us for His glorious work. Or we try to bargain with God, where we come to God and say, God, well, if you do this for me, I will attend church twice a month, or I will read my Bible three times a week, or I will try and pray every alternate Monday. That should do it, right? I'll get into heaven, you know. In other words, we see if we try to see if God works, then we will try to use Him whenever it suits us, whenever we feel like it. So, in other words, we are still Lord of our own lives. We truly haven't submitted to Him. So you need to ask yourself the question, who is the Lord of your life today? And in an article by Pastor Stephen Cole, he quotes a message by a prominent faith teacher, a prominent faith teacher, and I wish to share it with you. It says this, Now this is a real shocker, but God has to be given permission to work in this earth on behalf of man. 
Yes, you read that. Did you hear that? Okay. God has to be given permission to work in this earth uh, on behalf of man. Yes, you are in control. So if man is in control, who no longer has it? God. When God gave Adam, and Adam dominion, that meant God no longer had dominion. So God cannot do anything on this earth unless we let him. And the way we let him or give him permission is through prayer. What apostasy. What type of man tries to make God his servant? Clearly doesn't understand the supreme might of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Doesn't understand the sovereignty of his dominion over creation. He makes it as if he is the creator, not the creature. So how do we allow God to use us for His glory and for our own good? Well, last week, Pastor Pedro pointed us to the fact that we need to know God personally, right? We need to spend time with Him, studying His Word. We need to spend time with Him, meditating on His Scriptures. Time with Him in prayer. Time with other believers, yeah, who can help us, who can help each other in our walk with the Lord. And another way that we can use, or God can use us, is through our spiritual gifting. Paul has plenty to say about this in, in, um, in his letters, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, in Romans chapter 12, and Ephesians 4. Now, I'm not here to debate about the cessationists or the continuationists. No, that's not my point here. Paul explains to us the list of these gifts, and these include the lists of apostleship, right? the gifts of prophecy, the gifts of evangelism, of teaching, of preaching, of exhortation, the gifts of healing and miracles, the gifts of service, of administration, the gifts of leading, the gifts of faith, the gifts of mercy, the gifts of talking in tongues and interpreting tongues. You see, at conversion, the Holy Spirit takes residence within your heart and every believer has spiritual gifts. Some of us have a few more gifts than others, like the Apostle Paul had many gifts. He was clearly a gifted preacher, a teacher, an evangelist. He also had the gifts of healing and of miracles. So do you know what your spiritual gift is? Have you spent time trying to establish it, trying to work it out? God wants you for His service, for His glory. If you recall when we studied Uh, In our home groups, the book of Ephesians, J.D. Greer helps us to try to understand what our gifts are. We know that God has crafted us to do good things for His service. He has all given us abilities, He has given us passions, and He has given us people who affirm this in our lives. He has also given us wonderful resources, He has given us opportunities, and He has given us relationships. And we can all use this together with our abilities of others in the church, and we can use it for God, for His service. Because we know that the purpose of these gifts is to edify the church, not to edify ourselves, not like the exorcists who try to edify themselves through financial gain. Paul explains this in his letter to Ephesians. He says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we know that God's will for every believer is the same. His will is for us to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. Because one day we will be shouting and singing, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And his will is clearly found in the scriptures. He wants all men everywhere to come to faith and to repentance. He wants all believers to be spirit-filled, to be joyful, to be thankful, 
to be sanctified and to be set apart for His holy purposes. Ultimately, He wants us to be conformed to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. We also know that God's plan for each and every one of us is different. So have you figured out what your plan, that, well, what plan God has for you in your life? If not, seek it from Him. He wants to do mighty works through you for His kingdom and for His glory. Amen. So I want to pray the prayer that Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14. So let us pray. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and how long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to His power that is at work within us, to Him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.